Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have with us Dr. Melissa Delbello, who is Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics, Dr. Stanley and Mickey Kaplan Professor, and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience and Co-Director of the Division of Bipolar Disorders Research at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Today, she will talk about treatment options for bipolar depression in youth, which have been primarily studied in adults. Currently, only one medication is approved by the FDA for use in bipolar depression in use. However, there is a growing number of research on treatment options, and despite this, there is still a huge gap in clinical trials performed on adults and children. And as this webinar will show, extrapolating results of adult studies doesn't necessarily translate to successful treatment options for use. Furthermore, although medication is the cornerstone of treatment in children and adolescents with bipolar disorder, Dr. DeBello will discuss how psychosocial interventions are of paramount import, importance. Today, she will review the empirical evidence available for both pharmacological and psychosocial treatment strategies for bipolar depression. We welcome you, Dr. DeBello. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you everyone for taking time out of your schedules to participate in this webinar. Um, and there will be time at the end um, for questions, and so if anything's not clear during the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask. So we're going to be talking about depression associated with bipolar disorder. And we will be first um, covering a little bit about the mood state of depression when it's present in children with bipolar disorder. And then we'll talk about some treatments um, and some unique treatment strategies, such as um, what's the role of antidepressants, what about mood stabilizers, we'll talk about second generation antipsychotics, and then talk about psychotherapy and some other resources that may be of potential help and or interest. So what is depression associated with bipolar 1 disorder? When we think bipolar 1 disorder, we think mania. Man a manic episode is the illness defining episode for bipolar 1 disorder. If you have a manic episode, by definition, you have bipolar 1 disorder. So what are we talking about when we talk about depression associated with bipolar disorder? Well, we're talking about when a patient presents with the characteristics of a depressed episode, but in the past they have had a prior manic episode. And um, what, what presents is the depressive symptoms. So, for example, as we'll talk about a specific patient later, but if you have a child who presents with the classic characteristics of depression, such as depressed or irritable mood, decreased pleasure or interest for most of the day, nearly every day, for two weeks, those are the classic features of depression. And you also need um, other criteria like um, change in appetite, sleep problems, low energy, psychomotor agitation or slowing, suicidality, poor concentration, worthlessness, or poor self-esteem. So that's a classic depressed episode. So they present that way, but any child who presents that way should have an evaluation for a prior manic episode. Um, there doesn't necessarily mean there's a manic episode when they present, and they can have a depressive episode with some manic features of a manic episode, which is called mixed features, but they present with a full-blown depressive episode. What needs to be assessed is if they've had a history of mania. Additionally, um, the diagnosis of depression associated with bipolar disorder can be confused with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which is the new DSM-5 diagnosis that um, is in the differential when a child presents with irritability. Um, and the key characteristic is that you need to find that full-blown manic episode with 
elation, euphoria, irritability, um, and poor sleep, high energy, that has to be present in the past. If that's not present in the past, then it's just unipolar depression, not just, but unipolar depression without a bipolar diagnosis. But why this is so important is that the treatment of a depressive episode that presents with a history of mania versus a depressive episode that does not present with a history of mania is very different, as we'll discuss. So just I wanted to highlight a couple of changes in bipolar disorders with DSM-5. Um, as you may know, um, DSM-5 recently came out this past year, and there is no such thing as a mixed episode by DSM-5 any longer. A mixed episode used to be when a child presented with the features of a depressed episode and a manic episode. And unfortunately, they took that diagnosis somewhat out of DSM-5. And so that's the biggest change that is relevant to bipolar depression, and now the diagnosis, if they present with a mixed episode, can either be predominantly depression with mixed features or mania with mixed features, and we'll talk about the difference between that. But that's important because the treatment may differ depending on they pre if they present predominantly with depression with some features of mania or predominantly with mania with some features of depression. So what are these mixed feature diagnoses? Well, the one that's most relevant for someone who may present with depression with mixed features is if a child presents predominantly with depression and um, a full-blown episode of depression, but also has some manic or hypomanic symptoms. But they have to have certain manic or hypomanic symptoms that are not overlapping symptoms with depression. They may have an elevated mood, inflated self-esteem, decreased need for sleep, and an increase in energy or goal-directed activity. If they have that plus meet criteria for a full-blown depressive episode, we call that depression with mixed features. And that's in contrast to a manic episode with mixed features, which is a classic manic episode with some features of depressed mood, but it doesn't meet full criteria necessarily for a depressed mood. So the reason, again, it's different is because whichever mood is predominantly present is the mood that at this time we go about treating. And while we have a lot of treatments available, evidence-based treatments for mania that presents in a child or adolescent, as we'll talk about, there's very little evidence base for depression when it's present in a bipolar one child. So what's the difficulty in, in this diagnosis and making this diagnosis? Well, to, again, to make the diagnosis, you have to get a history of a prior manic episode, which may be very difficult because that's not how they're presenting. So you need to absolutely rely on collateral information from family members, from other caregivers, from medical records, from prior treatment providers, and also um, what's important is to get a good family history because um, one of the most familial illnesses we have in psychiatry is bipolar disorder. And so if there are relatives with bipolar disorder, um, if they're presenting with a depressive episode, that raises the suspicion um, enormously that maybe they have also a history of a manic episode. And depression associated with bipolar disorder um, is what scares me when I have a patient who presents with depression because these episodes versus a manic episode or a manic episode with depressive features, what we used to call a mixed episode, the depression is most severe in children and it lasts the longest, it has the lowest rates of recovery and it's most likely when you'll see a suicide attempt or um, a suicide. And so depression in a child with bipolar is um, a scary phase of the illness that we are understanding now is a more severe phase. 
Now um, we need to figure out how best to treat it. And again, suicidality is most likely to occur during a depressed episode in bipolar use. Um, and suicidal ideation and attempts are very common in this population. Um, and um, in any given population, um, there have been some studies that have found that 44% of a bipolar cohort may um, have suicidal ideation or attempts during a given year. Um, and during a lifetime, about a third of people who have their onset of bipolar during childhood or adolescence will have a significant medically serious suicide attempt during the course of their illness. Um, and that, that is higher than when you have your onset of bipolar during adulthood. It's more common to occur that they have suicidality if there is a co-occurring substance use disorder. Um, and so one of the key features in adolescence particularly who have bipolar disorder, is um, being proactive in ideally preventing or minimizing um, the co-occurring drug and alcohol use. So I just wanted to talk about um, a case example of a patient of ours um, who pretty classically um, represents what we're talking about when we talk about bipolar depression. So ARG is a 13-year-old girl who presents with passive suicidal ideation over the past month. That means that there's no active ideation that there, she's going to act on it, but she just thinks that things would be better off if she didn't wake up in the morning. ARG is unable to concentrate and is failing in school. Her energy level is low, her mood is depressed, and she has psychomotor motor slowing, and she recently quit her volleyball team and where she was one of the top players in prior years. She just didn't have the energy or interest to do it anymore. Now, she did have a strong family history of bipolar disorder and a maternal grandmother, um, and there was also a family history of depression. But 12 months prior to presenting as she did, she had a 10-day period of extreme irritability, hypersexuality, poor sleep with high energy, and grandiosity. She felt like she was invincible. And she admitted to having psychomotor agitation during that time, being very fidgety, and being told she talks too much, um, which led to her talking during class. And at that point, she was actually suspended from school. So um, this is pretty much a classic case of a girl who presents with depression, um, and we did not see the manic episode. She presented just with depression, and um, you had to ask about the prior symptoms 12 months ago of a manic episode, and again, in the setting where she did have a family history of bipolar disorder. So. The reason, again, this is important is because if she just presented with the depressive episode and um, no prior history of mania, then she might benefit from treatment with an antidepressant because at that point there's no bipolar family, there's no bipolar history, and it's more likely that she would remain unipolar um, than become bipolar even in the setting of a family history. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now and shift gears to talk about treatment. And um, at the, in the introduction, um, we talked about how there was one FDA-approved medication for children and adolescents with depression associated with bipolar disorder. And a lot of people guess lithium or lamotrigine, even quetiapine as the one FDA approved medication. It's actually a lanzapine fluoxetine combination and otherwise known as Symbiac. Some people may have heard of it. Um, it's a combination pill that's used a lot of times in primary care settings. Um, if psychiatrists use the lanzapine fluoxetine combination, a lot of times we don't use it in the one pill form. We'll use lanzapine and fluoxetine. But that is, at this point, the only FDA-approved medication for use in 
youth with depression associated with bipolar disorder. And we'll talk about the data that led to that indication and we'll talk about what data exists for the other three agents that are most commonly thought of to um, be used in depression associated with bipolar disorder. Just to reiterate, um, when you look at the FDA approved medications for acute mania, well, you see here that there are much more medications approved. Lithium is the oldest medication that's been around the longest despite a lack of evidence-based studies, the FDA did approve it for mania and for maintenance treatment. Risperidone, erpiprazole, quetiapine, olanzapine, and most recently acinapine are all approved for acute manic episodes in kids ranging anywhere from 10 to 17 or 13 to 17. Now for longer term maintenance, Lithium, of course, had the indication, and then aripiprazole is most recently been approved, um, and that's not necessarily based on great evidence-based, but rather based on long-term safety data as well as data in adults and um, short-term data that was that had a longitudinal follow-up, but. For acute depression in children and adolescents who have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, a lansipine-fluoxetine combination is the only medication that is FDA approved in ages 10 to 17, and that approval was in 2013. So clearly, despite being, at least in my opinion, one of the more severe parts of the illness, there are little evidence-based studies to suggest or guide treatment. So I just wanted to bring up a little bit about antidepressants and maybe highlight why it's very important to establish and why I spent so much time talking about diagnosis. And the reason is, is because um, as this study showed, and again, it's, it's not a huge study, but I think it shows um, to really bring home the point that if somebody presents with bipolar 1 disorder and um, is treated with antidepressants, they have a 80% chance of having a negative reaction. And this is, again, pediatric bipolar disorder. If somebody presents with bipolar 2, it's a 60% chance and bipolar not otherwise specified, um, it's between 50 and 60%. What I think is um, most unfortunate is that if somebody is treated with an antidepressant um, in any of these groups, that there's about a 30% chance that they will have new onset of suicidal ideation. And so um, even if they present with depressive symptoms and they have this diagnosis, probably antidepressant treatment is not the way to go, at least by itself. And so again, that's why it's so important to make the accurate diagnosis when somebody presents with depressive symptoms. So there's also been another study, and this study is a pretty old study, but like I said, there aren't many evidence-based studies. But this study was a retrospective small study of almost 60 patients with bipolar disorder. And this study showed us for the first time that maybe SSRIs or antidepressants were the most effective acute treatment for depression in a child with bipolar disorder. So they had almost seven times the chance of working than any other treatment in terms of getting the patient out of a depressed episode. However, there was the greatest chance to relapse in develop manic symptoms. And again, the chance of developing it was three times the chance if you weren't on an antidepressant. So it may make the depressive features better, but it actually can by itself um, accelerate manic symptoms um, returning. And so that is why, you know, when we talk about the olanzapine fluoxetine combination, yes, um, fluoxetine is an antidepressant, but it's being used with olanzapine. 
And again, this is a small study, a retrospective chart review, but nonetheless suggested that while antidepressants are maybe the most effective treatments for these depressive symptoms, without anything else, they run the risk of exacerbating manic symptoms. So what do we know about lithium? Um, in, in adults, lithium is commonly used. It's been shown to decrease suicidal um, ideation and attempts. Um, in youth, there have been there's been one open label study, not controlled, in adolescents ages 12 to 18, a small study of about 30 patients, um, and it was a six-week study um, of all depressed adolescents who had a prior manic episode. And in this study, about 50% were responders, 30% were remitters to the point where they had minimal symptoms, if any. Um, which, I mean, this isn't 50% responders in an open study. Um, and what you see here on the y-axis is childhood depression rating scale scores. And in contrast to studies with mania, we use the young mania rating scale score. But studies with depression in bipolar adolescence use, we use the children's depression rating scale. But that rating scale was really developed for unipolar depressed children. Um, we just don't have a better scale at this point for looking at and um, assessing over time depressive symptoms in bipolar youth. But here you can see that um, they were pretty sick, these children coming into the studies. 40 is generally the criteria for getting into a study. Above 40 is pretty depressed. Here they came in with a 65 on average, but even at seven weeks, or six weeks, sorry, even at six weeks, their CDRS scores were still 40. And so they were still depressed enough to get into the study. So it's not getting many people much better. Side effects, no surprise with lithium, nausea, vomiting, polyuria, polydipsia, headaches. So increased thirst and increased urination, very common and very disruptive, can be very disruptive. What about lamotrigine? Lamotrigine, lamictal is the other name for it, um, is used a lot for maintenance or prevention of recurrent episodes in adults. Um, there has been one open study of lamotrigine um, in a group of depressed bipolar 1, bipolar 2, or bipolar not otherwise specified adolescents. The problem with lamotrigine is that you have to titrate it fairly slowly to avoid um, the main side effect that we worry about with lamotrigine, which is Steven Johnson's or a rash all over your body that can end up um, in some cases having um, your kidneys and your heart fail, and um, even with death if it's not caught early. And so it's rare, very rare side effect, but um, it can happen, and it's associated often with fast rate of titration. So since people follow the slower titration, it's extremely, extremely rare. When people used to titrate or if people deviate from the titration of lamotrigine and go up to a target dose of about 200 milligrams per day, and if they do it more quickly than recommended, that's when you tend to run into trouble. Or if you use it with um, a medication like um, valproic acid or Depakote, um, that can increase levels of lamotrigine as well. So um, there are certain risk factors for the rash that if you avoid them, um, the nice thing about lamotrigine is that it is weight neutral, if not causes a decrease in weight. Um, but on average, the target dose is somewhere between 100 and 200 milligrams per day. But you can't titrate more quickly than 12.5 or 25 milligrams every couple of weeks, depending on the weight of the individual. So lamotrigine, though, um, in this study was found to reduce childhood depression rating scale scores to below 30 at the end of uh, this study. 
and response rates were a little bit higher than with lithium and remission rates, if you responded to lamotrigine, your symptoms were minimal. And so remission rates were very similar to responder rates. Um, side effects, some people get headaches, sleepiness, but not, not excessive sedation, um, nausea, sweating. Um, two people during this study had a rash, but um, none discontinued the medication due to the side effects because the rash was um, not found to be significant um, to discontinue. So the risk, the big risk, like I said, is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. The rate um, is eight per 1,000 in pediatric patients when used as adjunctive therapy, so added on for epilepsy. Um, in adults, the rate is three per thousand of any rash. Again, this is not just Stevens-Johnson, this is any rash. So it's very, very rare and uncommon, and it typically occurs when lamotrigine is used, again, with other medications, and um, when the rate of titration is faster than what's recommended. Um, so it's not ideal for patients who tend to go on and off their medications because you might imagine if you build up to a dose of about 200 milligrams um, and then you end up stopping it for a week and then you go back to 200 milligrams, that sets up the situation where you're more at risk for developing the rash. Um, also, people who take um, oral contraceptive pills, OCPs, or birth control pills, those people also, you need to kind of take lamotrigine with caution because um, high estrogen states um, lower lamictal levels, but then when you go off of them, your lamotrigine levels can raise pretty suddenly. So if you're taking the placebo pills that are in the oral contraceptive pill packs, that's when your lamotrigine level may fluctuate. So um, an alternative form of birth control would probably be ideal if somebody, if a woman's on lamotrigine. There's also been a recent study that's been presented, hasn't been published yet. Um, this is a study of lamotrigine for maintenance in bipolar children and adolescents. And the reason I bring this up is because, again, this gave us a lot of safety data in terms of how to use lamotrigine in this population. This was um, a study of all outpatients, children and adolescents who are 10 to 17 years old. They were all diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder and all presented with um, either a depressed episode, a manic episode, or a hypomanic episode. And everyone was treated, 340 kids were treated with lamotrigine for up to 18 weeks. And lamotrigine was added on to whatever other medications they were on, if they were on a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic, lamotrigine was added on. And then if they did stabilize, they were randomized to placebo or lamotrigine and looked at whether they developed another mood episode or another um, an outcome that required some other intervention. So it's a maintenance study. Um, and um, when they were randomized to lamotrigine and placebo, again, they stayed on whatever medication they were on from the beginning of the study. So it wasn't alone. It was adjunctive or added on to whatever conventional treatment that they were treated with. Well, what you can see here is that there was a trend towards a significant difference between the groups. Um, these are survival curves, and um, if it's at 100% or 1 throughout this whole thing, that means everyone was stable. If they started not surviving in the study and going down, that means that, um, that, that was, that's bad. That's a bad thing. And um, so if, something, if everyone was out of the study at the end, um, it would be down here. Um, and, and being out of the study means that some event happened um, that um, caused you to have a manic or depressed episode in this case. So it's a bipolar event. So here you can see that you were more likely to survive in the study without a bipolar 
event or another episode with lamotrigine at most time points versus placebo, but it didn't separate significantly. What I think is most interesting is in the 13 to 17 year old age range versus the little kids, the 10 to 12 year olds, there was greater separation in the adolescents. And that's a pretty significant separation here. And it did reach statistical significance. So perhaps for the adolescent group, lamotrigine may be more effective than placebo for um, maintaining or preventing another bipolar event. Um, and so I just bring it up again because in general, lamotrigine was well tolerated in this study that included you know, over 300 children initially. Okay, so what double-blind placebo-controlled data? That's our gold standard. What do we have? What evidence for? These have been all relatively small open studies um, for treating depression in bipolar children. Well, <clears throat> there have been two studies with quetiapine or Seroquel, and these studies were based on um, studies that in adults suggest quetiapine is fairly effective for bipolar depression. We did an initial study with our colleagues at Stanford. Um, they, there were 32 kids in the study, and they were um, all adolescents, all had depression associated with bipolar disorder. And what we found here is um, that this, again, is baseline childhood depression rating scale scores. They were in both groups, the placebo group or the quetiapine group, um, they were about 55. And then at end point, both groups had a reduction in depressive symptoms, but um, there was no difference between the groups. So this study tells us that quetiapine was no more effective than placebo um, and that both treatments may be effective or being in a study where you're coming in weekly um, for some sort of interaction with study staff um, is not no treatment, so they're actually getting some sort of supportive therapy, um, and that may be enough for these children to have some improvement in their depressive scores. Um, but then, you know, that's a small study, whether you believe it or not. You know, again, it's a small study, and we had a large placebo effect. But um, then there was the larger study with almost 200 children. Um, this was of the extended release quetiapine. And again, the same design that it was placebo or quetiapine for depression associated with, in this case, it was bipolar 1 or bipolar 2. And the outcome was change in depression rating scale again, and the dosing was 150 to 300. Although it was the extended release, that's the same dosing we used in the two-site study. And pretty much identical to the other study, the placebo response was similar to the quetiapine XR response. And this was in almost 10 times as many kids. And so there was no statistically significant difference. Both groups had about a 25 to 30 point reduction um, in the, their depressive rating scale scores, which is pretty significant within each group. So in this population, um, being depressed may be responsive to patients in these studies come in at least weekly, if not more often, um, and so that may not be the best placebo um, because they are getting a lot of supportive therapy. No surprise in terms of side effects, weight gain was significant, sedation, headaches, dizziness, um, no, no big surprises with quetiapine. What about the olanzapine fluoxetine combination? So this is a study um, that was done because um, Symbiax or OFC is indicated for adults with bipolar depression and because of federal laws at this point, they have to do a study um, similar to their adult indications in kids um, with the same diagnosis. So this, the study was done in bipolar depressed kids. They all had bipolar one disorder and the randomization in this study was two to one. So there was only one third of a chance that somebody would get placebo and two thirds of a chance that they would get 
olanzapine, fluoxetine combination. And um, again, the mean outcome measure was the children's depression rating scale. And here, in contrast to the other study that we just looked at, um, there was a greater decrease in depressive symptoms in the OFC group versus the placebo group. Um, and, you know, it started off that they were pretty similar, but the OFC group reduced more significantly. But again, if you look at the reduction in depressive symptoms, it was similar in the OFC group to what we just talked about in the quetiapine group. In this study, though, the placebo response was less than in the other studies. So in this study, um, placebo response was minimized, and that led to a significant difference in the FDA indication. However, as most people know, with olanzapine, the side effects were pretty significant. And about 14% discontinued in this study um, during the course of the study. The study was, I should have said, an eight-week study. Um, and about 15% discontinued. And weight increase was about 20%. This is weight increase that was complained about during the study. Um, but you can see that um, in the olanzapine fluoxetine group, there was 4.4 kilograms, which is about 10 pounds. And in the placebo group, there was minimal weight gain. Um, so again, about 50% of patients gain more than 7% of their body weight from baseline. And so that's pretty significant, not an extremely well-tolerated medication. Um, fasting triglycerides, lipids um, were abnormal as well, more likely in the OFC group. Prolactin elevation was high um, as well, and that can lead to menstrual problems and um, breast buds developing in boys. And so, um, again, OFC may be effective, but it's not particularly well tolerated. And I just wanted to bring up um, a newer medication because it's the only medication that we don't know about yet in kids, but in adults, it's approved for bipolar depression. The medication is lorazodone um, or Latuda. And this medication um, may be better tolerated, at least in adults, may be associated with less weight gain. Um, it has unique um, affinities um, high affinities for 5-HT2A um, antagonism and 5-HT7 antagonism. It is a second generation antipsychotic, um, but um, in adults it was shown to be highly effective for bipolar depression. A couple of caveats with the medication. Um, it is metabolized by cytochrome P453A4, so it can interact with some medications. Um, and it has to be taken with at least 350 calories, which may be difficult at times, particularly if you're dosing it in the evening or, um, or late afternoon. So, um, but we're, we're likely to hear more about lorazodone for bipolar depression. There is an ongoing study in um, pediatrics um, at this point, hopefully within the next year or so, we'll have some more data. So I just wanted in the last couple of minutes to talk about psychotherapeutic interventions that are evidence-based for depression associated with bipolar disorder because really the effect sizes for these medications or how effective they are, uh, for these interventions um, or how effective they are may be just as effective as the medications we talked about. Um, and so, you know, while medication, it would be nice and hopefully it would solve the problem more quickly. Um, therapy might be the more long-term solution for depression associated with bipolar disorder in kids. Um, Evidence-based strategies, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, this is where you, you know, attempt to change the negative thought patterns and behaviors. Um, David Mikowitz's family-focused therapy, um, that um, the study in bipolar youth and in adults um, seems to have the greatest effect for depression or depressive symptoms. Um, and it includes families or caregivers 
and it improves family coping strategies, communication, problem solving. It also has an educational component to it that um, teaches um, the family and the um, child to identify um, trigger symptoms or events and focuses a bit on prevention. Um, then there's also interpersonal and social rhythm therapy. We have very little data in children but in adults um, and it seems to make sense that this type of treatment would get children into routines, increase structure, um, maintain normal sleep cycles, all of which is very important to prevent recurrent episodes. Psychoeducation, that of course is important. Um, any psychoeducational approach, um, the sooner you treat depressive symptoms, the more likely the treatment is going to be effective. So this strategy um, focuses on teaching children in the family that um, to recognize early warning signs of relapse. And then mindfulness-based therapies, um, there is um, pure mindfulness, there's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and it teaches um, relax relaxation techniques, regulation of emotion, and through basically accepting emotions. Um, and more and more we're seeing some evidence that mindfulness-based therapies may be effective for improving emotion regulation and treating depressive symptoms in this population. Other resources I just want to mention, obviously the International Bipolar Foundation website has a lot of in accurate information on its website. There are other online support communities through DBSA. There is a Balanced Mind Parent Network um, that is an online support community for parents of children with bipolar disorder. And then um, hopefully everyone's seen the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Parents Medication Guide for Children with Bipolar Disorder. If not, um, ACAP has parent med guides for several mental health issues um, and the parent med guide, parentsmedguide.org, or if you search on the ACAP website, you can access it. Um, it's a lot of information, but these are um, resources that I know have accurate information. And in the back of the ACAP Parents Med Guide, there are additional resources listed that may be helpful. So in conclusion, um, bipolar depression is often difficult to diagnose due to the retrospective nature of the diagnosis that you have to find a retrospective manic episode to make the diagnosis. Um, there are no effective and well-tolerated pharmacologic interventions for depression associated with bipolar disorder in children. Um, there are maybe OFCs effective, but it's not particularly well tolerated. And so we really don't have a pharmacologic intervention at this point that is both effective and well tolerated. Um, potential strategies in the future, more studies, we need some with lorazodone because again, it's US FDA approved for bipolar depression in adults. Um, we also need more studies evaluating the role of antidepressants as adjunctive treatment, not as monotherapy. So with that, I will end and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation and your insight, Melissa. Um, the first question we have is this listener is 23, 23 years old and a college student with bipolar, bipolar 1 disorder. And they are struggling with graduation and have failed a couple of times. Um, you said when they go to exams, they're mostly depressed and feel a lot of pressure to perform in the exam, which they can't cope with. Um, how, do you, can you recommend any way that I can ensure success? Well, it, yeah, it's a, one of the most significant problems with depression, unipolar or bipolar depression, is that when you're depressed, you can't think clearly and concentrate. And when that happens, then that leads to problems in school or in your job, and then that leads to more depression. So it's this cyclical pattern that it's important as a first step to recognize and then get 
the best treatment for your mood symptoms and make sure those are stable so that you can give school its best effort and see if once your mood's stable, you're able to concentrate. Now, as most people know, there's a high comorbidity with ADHD and bipolar disorder. And so adjunctive treatment with treatments for ADHD may be necessary, but that can only be evaluated once a person's mood is stable and then assessing their ability to concentrate. So I think the best bet is to get treatment for the depression. Great, thank you for that answer. The next question is, there have been numerous clinical double blind studies in the US and many countries um, that current, and they currently use um, ketamine, minimum psychotic episode. Um, do you know where the studies are now? And as it has been proven as an immediate control of suicide ideation. Okay, so um, in children, we have only one study of um, intranasal ketamine, and it's um, Dimitri Popolos's group, and it's a small sort of case series kind of study. Um, but that, those data suggest that it potentially might be effective for children. Um, it, you know, there are several studies that have been ongoing that suggest in some cases suicidal ideation, you know, dissipates within hours. And so um, it's pretty dramatic. We don't know yet, is it, um, is it maintained, that relief in suicidality? Um, and there, you know, are several studies that have shown that it alleviates depressive symptoms as well. Again, we don't know for how long and what type of maintenance treatment is necessary with ketamine. But hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have a lot more answers of how to use ketamine most effectively. But I think for acute um, depression with suicidality, in adults, um, you know, that, that we have some evidence that it's effective. We don't yet for kids. Great, thank you. The next question, um, on any of the studies that you discussed, um, do they show if the kids were on Medicaid um, versus private insurance? Um, you know, they don't in terms, um, they, they might show, um, yeah, they probably don't. They might show socioeconomic status, but um, it's a wide variety um, of, you know, we, we have participated in most of the studies and it's a wide variety of participants. So I would say demographically, um, it, you know, it's, pretty diverse, but I, I don't know the numbers or what percent were Medicaid. Great, thank you. The next um, question and also a comment. Um, the question is, can a traumatic event bring about the increase in symptoms or bring, bring to light the symptoms of bipolar disorder? Um, and she also goes on to, to make a comment thanking you um, for the information, it's been helpful for her to look back and understand her adult son's behavior as a child and teen. Thank you for your um, comment. I appreciate it. And um, traumatic events, we know that stressful life events can trigger the onset of illness and the onset of recurrent episodes, um, particularly early in the course. So once you've had... Um, you know, four episodes, it's not as clear cut of a relationship between stressful life events and the onset of an episode. But early in the course, we absolutely know that stressful life events, good stressful life events and bad stressful life events um, can trigger the onset of bipolar. But it wouldn't trigger it unless people have the right genetic makeup. So it's unusual that someone would have a traumatic event, have the onset of their manic episode, and they probably would have gotten it at some point later. It's just that traumatic event at that time triggered it. So 
um, there is a relationship. There's also a relationship between um, onset of substance use as well as poor sleep or um, traveling between different um, time zones that may trigger the onset of a, a new episode. Wonderful, thank you for that answer. And it looks like that's the last of our questions. However, I know at times um, we do have questions or thoughts that come to our head post the webinar. And please know that I am available to take those questions at dbrown at ibpf.org. And also I want to remind you that this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be archived on our website for further viewing. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Dabello, for um, sharing with us. Thank you for having me. Bye.